All right, welcome into Surviving Paradise, the podcast that takes a sometimes serious, oftentimes humorous look, especially this week, at the claim by leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses that they are living in a modern day spiritual paradise. I am your host, Stacey Bauman, former elder, ministerial servant, and a kid raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses in the 70s and 80s, as I do every week. We try to have some fun here, a little bit of a warning. We're going to have a lot this week, at least in my opinion. Each episode features sarcasm, humor, my own experiences and observations, but please note none of this is ever meant to offend. We appreciate any and all that may listen in, no matter where you are on your journey, in or out, or just curious about Jehovah's Witnesses. So welcome in this week, and I'll tell you, I'm in a mood. You've been warned. There will be laughter. I don't think I can stifle it, quite frankly. And buckle in. Here we go. I want to start by asking, have you ever been insulted? I know. It's a really stupid question. It probably started in kindergarten, right? Bad haircut, booger in your nose, doesn't matter what it is. It's a stupid question. According to William Irvine, Ph.D., professor of philosophy and author of the book, A Slap in the Face, Why Insults Hurt and Why They Shouldn't, he tells us the following, quote, The act of insulting others is hardwired into humans. It starts with our natural need to belong to a group for our own survival. Once part of a group, we try to rise within its social hierarchy in order to flourish, end quote. The good doctor has a lot to say about the subject of insults, and he continues with the following, quote, he calls the desire to rise in society the social hierarchy game. Wolves and dogs rise within their social circles through physical conflict. Because humans evolved brains and language, we use words and gestures. We try to rise in society by putting others in their place, Irvine says, by insulting and causing them pain, end quote. And so now, with that question and answer, I present to you the following opinion. Insulting the intelligence of Jehovah's Witnesses is woven into everything the governing body does. I know that's not a revelation for most people listening, but rest assured that they insult the intelligence of everyone who listens to them. It's a masterful technique that has been employed by men since the dawn of time. You might even say it goes back to the most famous snake ever. You remember him and how he masterfully used simple questions to undermine the intelligence of two perfect naked people. All rational thinking ability, apparently, there's that word, went out the window in an instant. Because who doesn't want another piece of fruit that will make you smile? apparently already? Also bringing into question how they could be Perfect and smart, but uh, apparently not smart enough to resist a talking snake. Why aren't we all smart enough to know that snakes have? Or question, in their case, why these trees were placed in the garden to look at and not touch anyway. Okay, I'm going to stay on track. and It's going to be difficult this week. I must share that I'm often asked if the governing body themselves, all nine of them, lack intelligence. I can hear people answering as I say that. Or are they openly insulting ours by design? Do they do it and know it? Let's let them answer for themselves, citing just one example of how they do what they do to 8 million plus Jehovah's Witnesses Pay attention to this quote and story and what they are doing to the people that are listening to or reading it. The Watchtower of 1999, December 1st, pages 26 through 29, features a series called Do Not Let Your Strength Become Your Weakness. 
And there, the governing body tells us this, quote, A good mind is certainly a fine asset. Still, it could become a weakness if it leads to overconfidence or causes us to develop an inflated opinion of ourselves, especially if others commend us excessively hmm, or flatter us. Or we might develop an intellectual view of God's Word and Bible-based study publications. Overconfidence may surface in various ways. For example, when someone with a fine mind <laughs> receives a speaking assignment in the Christian congregation, perhaps a public discourse or a talk in the theocratic ministry school, he may leave preparation to the last minute, something I witnessed every week. Back to the quote, maybe not even praying for Jehovah's blessing. Rather, he trusts in his reserve of knowledge and in his ability to think on his feet. This is a regular practice of elders people every week. Back to the quote, natural ability may mask his laxness for a time, but without Jehovah's blessing, his spiritual progress would slow down, perhaps even stop. What a waste of a fine gift, end quote. Does any of that, or does anyone out there spot a low-key set of insults? And here comes that uncorroborated experience that the Watchtower makes famous, of course, from a nameless person. Quote, back to the article, in Australia, a Christian elder and family man who was also a highly successful businessman had the world before him, as the saying goes. Yet, he refused the temptation to make it in this system. I wanted to spend more time with my family and in the Christian ministry. End quote. As you might imagine, this brother is propped up for us as showing overt intelligence the only way he should have. Guess what he did? He made sacrifices and then we're told this, quote, In time, he was invited to share in other privileges of service, such as serving on the local assembly hall committee and in district convention administration. Wisely channeled, his strengths brought him and his family joy and satisfaction, end quote. And there it is. If you can't spot it, give it another listen, or please go look up the reference for yourself. I mean, there is a smart guy. And you too should be smart by doing what he did. Giving up everything, standing in front of a book cart, and being told he's very important when he's the cleaning overseer washing toilets at the district convention. That, folks, is intelligence, and it is not an insult at all. We are told that we should be doing the same, and essentially it comes down to this. Serve nine guys in upstate New York. Using one of a million examples that we go into on the show regularly, you're only as smart as they say you are. From examining the scriptures daily, March 4th, 2012, we are told this, quote, However, we cannot hope to acquire a good relationship with Jehovah if we ignore those whom Jesus has appointed to care for his belongings. Without the assistance of the faithful and discreet slave, we would neither understand the full import of what we read in God's word nor how to apply it. End quote. There it is. You're as smart as they say you are. And if you didn't pick up on it in that Holy Spirit nugget, that too was an insult. You apparently can't pick up on what's being taught in the Good Samaritan parable. You can't pick up on what's being taught in the prodigal son. You don't understand what it means to love your neighbor or to love your wife. It's all over your head, unless you get the assistance of the faithful and discreet slave. And I don't know. My favorite with Jehovah's Witnesses, Psalms 146.3, seems 
pretty clear. It says, don't follow men, <laughs> but you're saying we should follow you. Got it. This is weekly messaging inside Jehovah's Witnesses, and it provides a ton of content for this crazy show, and many just like it. And folks, it's an insult. It's an insult to our intelligence. The insults to a Jehovah's Witness intelligence, well, they just never end. I never could have dreamed that one day I would be watching the governing body and their helpers on their own streaming channel. Back in the day, I had no clue their names or what they looked like when they were actually made the governing body in the early 70s. No clue. But JW Broadcasting has personalized the wise teachings of the nine guys in upstate New York, and as of late, they make it all too easy to peek behind the curtain and get a real view and examine the motives of all nine of them. The changes are coming fast and furiously from heaven, making this, in my opinion, and that's all it is, a very unique time in Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, for those of us watching on and nursing the wounds of wasted time, lost family, friends, and more, we likely struggle to understand how, the, how those that we care about that are still trapped inside this organization in 2024 can't see what is happening. The emotions range from laughter to suffocating frustration. How can anyone believe these nine men were chosen by an almighty God of love to represent him to, to other humans? Because again, he apparently, as God, has some real communication issues himself and feels that using other imperfect men is the, the best way to communicate to 8 billion plus people on the planet? Apparently, he has already used up his bag of tricks that we learned about in the past. You know, things like talking animals, or the sun standing still in the sky, or angels that look a lot like Kenny Rogers appearing and guiding people. What about burning bushes? I could keep going. Those methods to communicate seem to work in the past, giving life-saving information to people that were willing to listen. Despite the success of such communication from God, he's just apparently over it all. Celestial phenomena, miracles, and stuff are all tired old news to Jehovah. Without much explanation, Jehovah, after decades of watching false religious televangelists and even condemning them in his literature, well, he decided he too would create a TV studio and communicate with all of mankind via a .org website. Now he uses nine guys in New York and some book carts to announce that we must believe everything they say or he's going to kill us all. Check that. He's going to let those same nine guys kill us all when they get to heaven and exact their revenge on those of us that just can't believe babies are enemies of God, or frankly, that, that Stephen Lett isn't a character from Family Guy. I mean, come on. But they keep giving us visible proof of what they are, an ever-evolving man-made cult. Over the past couple of weeks, including Governing Body Update number 3, and the May 2024 JW broadcast, they continue to provide proof for anyone paying attention as to what they are. We're going to unpack both episodes just a little this week, just highlights, including how their current messaging is apparently causing some confusion in the ranks of the future paradise dwellers. Not to mention those that also might be on a fast track to heaven, just not part of the fine nine. Let's start here first by taking a closer look at Governing Body Update number three, hosted by future king Jeffrey Winder. 
quickly becoming a fan favorite, I might add. Incidentally, I, I have to say it right here, has anyone confirmed or can they confirm that King Winder isn't in fact just an AI-generated person because <laughs> he looks like it? And I got questions. I'm watching this guy much closer now. D wow, does that make me obedient, by the way? He looks a little too vanilla to me around the edges. A little too sharp. I don't know. Just my thoughts. He also, by the way, incidentally, hasn't shown up with a beard, which leads me to believe that, uh, I don't know, he likes shaving or he drew the short straw and he has to be the guy that keeps clean shaven to give it a good balance in the fine nine. Uh, but seriously, when I watch Jeffrey Winder in Governing Body Update number three, I'm getting Westworld vibes. Am I the only one? I'm getting Westworld vibes. I'll move on. During the recent broadcast, King Winder provides some interesting updates on how what he calls, quote, our relief work following recent disasters in Southeast Asia uh, is going. They are facing a tragic drought and a flood. And he goes on to say that 13,500 publishers, a nice even number, it's kind of interesting, need basic assistance in three countries. He goes on to say, the governing body, that's right, I want you to pay attention to this, quote, the governing body has sent funds to the brothers so they can receive basic food items, and boy, did they give them some good ones, back to what he says, such as maize, beans, dried fish, and cooking oil, end quote. Am I the only one that, as he's saying that, is thinking, I bet that's not what you guys are eating in upstate New York. <laughs> but that's what they send the brothers in need in these countries. If you're sitting back right now and you're thinking, wow, that type of update sounds very familiar, uh, you're not alone. He highlights our relief work and the governing bodies sending funds. Very specific. And again, does any of that sound familiar to you? Because if it does, you're not alone. I was instantly watching this update transported back to the Bible stories book that I had in my lap as a kid and the fantastic illustration of Moses flanked by his calf-worshipping buddy and priest, Aaron, who apparently was not an apostate and got to actually even keep being a priest. Wild. But I was transported back there when Moses, as God's assigned rep on earth, prior, of course, to the nine guys in upstate New York, was providing his own update of, quote, his relief work. You remember, the Israelites were bitching that they were thirsty. So Moses sent funds. What? Apologize? I, I, scratch that. He hit a rock with his stick and provided the basic assistance for God's people. And, uh, well, <laughs> in this moment, I, this is awkward, King Jeffrey. Jehovah actually wasn't too happy with Moses when he provided, quote, his relief work update. And despite Moses tending sheep for 40 years, talking to burning bushes, splitting open entire seas, punking Pharaoh and leading millions through the desert, uh, taking multiple hikes up a mountain just to watch Jehovah's finger appear and create 10 laws on rock, but then oddly expecting him to walk back down the mountain with heavy rock tablets, building copper serpents, collecting magic mana food, and look, so much more. Well, Jeff... Uh, I hate to break the news to you, when, when Moses did this one relief work, he, uh, despite all that Moses had done in his lifetime, Jehovah was so pissed at Moses. <laughs> he was pissed at him when he provided an update with that water out of rock thing. Jehovah told him he doesn't get to go into the promised land after all. Then, in my opinion, one of Jehovah's greatest troll jobs he takes Moses up on a mountain 
and he actually shows him what he's going to be missing out on. Hey, Moses, thanks for all that stuff you did for me. Look over there. That's the promised land. You can't go. And by the way, as the account reads, Jeffrey, he then kills him. <laughs> Moses dies. Wow. And do you know why this all happened, Jeffrey? Well, because Moses provided what we are told was his relief work update by giving the Israelites some water they needed. Wow, have times changed. Wow, has Jehovah changed? Now we get his relief work updates from his chosen human reps on the internet, courtesy of governing body update number three. But these guys, boy, did their outcome change and, and is dramatically different than poor Moses. <laughs> They get to live in forest surroundings in upstate New York. Times have changed, Jeffrey. And while I appreciate this update in Governing Body, update number three, boy, do I have some questions. And, and while the Bible stories picture, for anybody who remembers out there, it actually shows Moses pointing at himself like, hey, look at me doing this for you. Uh, but I guess you can relate, huh, Jeff? You're doing the exact same thing Moses did right now on video in Governing Body Update number three. <laughs> and I must say, uh, Brother Winder, you don't seem to have the resume Moses had, but look at you. You're a future king anyway, and we should hang on your every word. Nonetheless, it makes perfect sense. You're doing exactly what got Moses killed. But never mind, I forgot. You're going to resurrect Moses anyway. I bet he's going to have some questions for you. Maybe you two can sit and compare life stories, his versus yours. <laughs> we know what he did. And well, Jeffrey, you invented book carts. <laughs> he's going to be so impressed. So impressed. Governing body update number three starts with a bang, folks. But it's worth mentioning that despite, uh, again, speaking to King Jeffrey Winder, that despite you and your eight friends pulling water from that, rock, oops, I mean, sorry, sending relief funds, you conclude this part of your update by thanking those that truly made that aid possible. Those that sent you donations and money, even though you call it our relief work, the governing body. <laughs> but you remember those people, right, that sent the money? The very people watching the video. And the insult to people's intelligence continues <laughs> right from the outset of governing body update number three. These are stories I remember as a kid. Apparently, Jeffrey missed the point of Moses pulling water from the rock. Uh, but as the update continues, let's address what appears to be Jesus' very poor communication skills. I, I don't know how you chalk it up any other way. And again, wow, have times changed. Jesus, from the greatest man that ever lived and the Great Teacher, which, by the way, was the coolest pink book ever made. They've never done that again. Where's my uh, 70s kids? The Pink Great Teacher book. But, but from those things, from being a masterful teacher of parables and illustrations that drew hungry crowds hanging on his every word, from being the most important prophet in universal history, from being the creator of space and time, from being the commander of myriads and myriads of angels who he had to communicate with, from the only king we will ever need to a guy that needs to clarify his instruction to the sisters on how to put their pants on one leg at a time and what type of pants they should wear because... When he gave the ladies permission to wear pants a few weeks ago, 
he just wasn't clear enough on the directions, as we will see in Governing Body Update number three. Listen, the world is on the clock, but every now and then, even Jesus takes a break to work on some new fashion advice. It's only reasonable. This is very important stuff that King Jeffrey Winder is disseminating to Jehovah's Witnesses, never really thinking how it taps into their adult intelligence. Uh, yeah. The governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses not only insulting grown-ass adults regarding their clothing, but then having to walk back how and what those clothes should be because, again, Jesus apparently is a bad communicator. Scrap that greatest teacher moniker once and for all. <laughs> Brother Winder goes on to say in this update, by the way, at this point, I must encourage anyone listening to go watch it. It is available on Jesus' website. You can see, listen, watch, and hear everything I'm discussing here for yourself. Go do it. But Brother Winter goes on to say, quote, We have had updates on dress and grooming. We've talked about beards for brothers, slacks for sisters, and the use of jackets and ties for brothers. We're thankful that Jehovah trusts us in these matters. But some questions came up. <laughs> Imagine that. Quote, do these adjustments on dress and grooming mean we are lowering our standards? Not at all. End quote. <laughs> oh, no, Jeff. No, no, no. And now for the Holy Spirit spin job, courtesy of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. I hope you're sensing the intelligence. First, yes. He did say that the Almighty God of the universe trust him and his eight male friends on all things fashion. Thanks for confirming. That includes, by the way, fashion for the ladies, the women and the sisters of Jehovah's Witnesses. Up next, they'll tell the ladies how to give birth to babies. Just ask Jeff because Jehovah trusts them with that too. And we know that Jehovah trusts the governing body with teaching the sisters fashion because, well, listen, the governing body has a well-documented history of great advice on what you ladies and sisters should be doing when it comes to what you wear. Remember this sage advice? It comes to us from the Awake of 1976, August 8th, pages 24 through 26 is the series Dressing in a Modest and Attractive Way, where the governing body told the women this, remember Jehovah trusts them, quote, when the fit is good, <laughs> I'm going to try to get through this, when the fit is good, the line's simple and the style suits her particular figure, a, a woman can be well-dressed. A wealthy woman spending a very large amount for a dress may not be as smartly clothed as a woman who makes her own dress for much, much less. An outfit may be expensive, but if it is the wrong color for a woman's skin and hair, it can detract from rather than enhance her looks. If it emphasizes her bad features figure-wise, it too will not be to her advantage. End quote. No wonder Jehovah trusts these guys. <laughs> ladies, ladies, I know you're not feeling insulted right now, right? You're a Jehovah's Witness sister looking for some fashion advice to, uh, quote, enhance your figure and looks. And of course, after asking Jehovah for direction first in a prayer on how to make your ass look great in a pencil skirt, you undoubtedly called New York and asked to speak to Stephen Lett, Sam Hurd, or Jeffrey Winder, right? This is important stuff. You don't want to be caught 
emphasizing your bad features at the next meeting to you. <laughs> and they know best. They recently gave you pants. And well, let's make sure what you're wearing is good for your figure and really enhances your qualities. The right kind of pants. We don't want you to emphasize your bad features. Maybe they will set up a Bethel hotline where sisters can send photos asking if their new pants complement their skin and hair color. How's my ass look? It only seems right. It only seems right, people. Jesus and his father are watching on. And this is clearly a very important situation to them in heaven. So you ladies, you sisters, get it right. Come on now, get it right. I wonder what advice Jehovah gave Noah's wife and their daughter-in-laws right before the flood about what they were dressing in. Were they shaving their legs? Did their, their clothes complement their skin right before the water hit? <laughs> and there it is. We're talking about insulting your intelligence. That's right from their literature. And Jeffrey's landing the point home in governing body update number three. But let's make sure we include the inspired direction regarding dress to all Jehovah's Witnesses, including the brothers. And we can't go any further without considering Jesus' inspired direction. Uh, uh, wait for it. Wait for it. Jesus' inspired counsel on underwear. That's right. Jeffrey's concerned about our clothes in 2024, but he's not the first governing body member to comment on things like uh, your underwear. How do you feel about your underwear today? Is your underwear in good shape? Does it honor Jehovah? Yes, you heard that right. Jehovah and Jesus have a lot to say about your underwear. What kind of underwear should a Jehovah's Witness wear when it's cold outside, for example, you might ask? The governing body has the following counsel for us intelligent people, and it's not an insult at all. It comes to us from the Awake of 1971, January 22nd, pages 12 through 14, under the article, Dress Right for Cold Weather, under the subheading, what kind of underwear? <laughs> we get this little tidbit of counsel. Quote, let us start with the clothing closet. Excuse me. Let us start with the clothing closest to the body. It is reasonable to wear warmer undergarments in the winter than in the summer, even if you do not feel the need for it, end quote. This isn't insulting at all, right? Not at all. Back to the quote, why? Because the heart must work harder to keep the body warm in winter, and warmer clothing saves it added work. <laughs> of course, if you work in a steam-heated room or office all day, you will not want to wear the same kind of underwear that the postman spending his whole day outside wears. But what kind should it be if you must be out in the cold? Simply wearing heavier underwear may not be the best solution. <laughs> End quote. <laughs> Food at the proper time from the faithful and discreet slave. Not insulting at all. How have I survived all of these years without giving prayerful consideration to that advice? I am so glad that they clarified that if working inside all day, I just don't want to wear the same kind of underwear my mailman is wearing. <laughs> and I got to tell you, I love it. I see an opportunity to start an informal witness at the mailbox today. I strike up a conversation with my mailman about his underwear and subtly shift the conversation to God's kingdom. He won't even see it coming, and it all started with his underwear. <laughs> I'm going to place a book. You people just watch. But, but again, only if Jehovah draws him, only if Jehovah draws him, I think I'll start with a question 
based on the governing body's counsel found here. Something like this, maybe, hey, mailman, what kind of underwear do you have on? That's sure to hook him. <laughs> but folks, it gets better. The Holy Spirit is never cut off when it comes to the governing body, and they're definitely not insulting us. The council of found in the awake of 1974, March 8th, pages 24 through 26. I am going to try to get through this, folks. I'm doing my best. Under the article, Banishing B.O. Under the subheading, What Can Be Done About B.O.? The governing body tells us this. Quote, what causes some persons to have a strong and unpleasant body odor and what can be done about it? A common reason why some have BO is that they are wearing underwear in which they have sweated profusely. While sweat itself under normal conditions is quite odorless, garments in which we have sweated tend to have a strong odor because of the action of bacteria. So, one remedy would be to change the underwear more often, end quote. <laughs> Jeffrey Winder, the governing body, and update number three got nothing on the Holy Spirit and direction that came prior to them in 2024 inspired information from the faithful and discreet slave chosen by Jesus himself, the guy who walked on water and raised the dead in 1919. This wise counsel on changing your underwear often, well, it works well with the current counsel given in governing body update number three this week. <laughs> Times do change, and so should your underwear. Especially if they uh, smell, by the way. If your underwear smell, change them. And by the way, none of this is insulting. I'm wondering what direction they have for those of us that, I don't know, prefer going commando as we make a conscious decision to honor Jehovah's original purpose of walking the planet freeballing. Be on the lookout for how swamp ass is now a disfellowshipping offense. I, you can't make this stuff up. It's just unbelievable. This is food at the proper time. And Jeffrey Winder is emphasizing in 2024 that this whole issue of clothing, grooming, how to put on pants, men, women, children, neckties and all, is a really big deal to Jehovah. It goes back several decades. He's been taking a closer peek at our underwear. <laughs> it's just unreal. King Winder goes on to emphasize all of this, of course, to the very attentive audience of Jehovah's Witnesses who probably have no idea about the references I just shared. That, you know, acceptable styles change over time, even citing governing body update number eight from 2023, where he shows us a cartoon example of how people dressed in Bible times and even a hundred years ago, it's a cartoon, by the way, that looks strikingly like King Chuck Taze Russell, who I'm guessing has likely slipped that one in from his seat in heaven. He emphasizes the times change. And I got to tell you, after all of this counsel, I'm feeling more intelligent already. I'd like to thank the kindness and the direction of the governing body for presenting all these facts. It's very important for a Jehovah's Witness as the world launches itself towards a mass genocide. But King Winder goes on in the update. He had dressed uh, how to respect Jehovah now that we can grow facial hair and the ladies don't have to shave their legs. And uh, of course that they want to, it's a conscious matter. He cites three Bible examples in the update and in insulting, absolute condescending fashion says, quote, you know these principles and you love Jehovah. We know they are important to you, end quote. Employing what is a basic 
mind control technique to get everyone watching the video at home to nod their heads in agreement. As you might guess, they target the sisters first, as I'm guessing some sisters showed up to the kingdom all somewhere in some tight-fitting jeans or something. He goes on to insult everyone's intelligence by breaking down the definition of the word appropriate. I'm not kidding. Then we need to evaluate what we wear when worshiping Jehovah, all the while ignoring that the God that never makes a mistake, uh, he actually had an original purpose, Jeffrey, that didn't even include clothes at all. He wanted us to be nude. You might remember C. Genesis. But intelligence doesn't play a role in this. You can't even read the Bible without him and his eight friends. You can't discern these things. You can't arrive at conclusions. So they need to tell us. And when they gave us back some pants and we could throw away the neckties and we shave and don't shave, you know, we need to explain that in finer detail. And as I sat here watching this, I couldn't help but think, why is an imperfect man having to walk back Jesus Christ's latest grooming changes? I've heard from several people that older generations of Jehovah's Witnesses are not happy with some of these changes. And boy, I've been out 14 years. I'd love to walk through a kingdom hall and see all the old people glaring at the younger generations because that's my guess as to what's happening. Older generations of Jehovah's Witnesses are in shock. Beards and pants? I can only venture to guess that the brothers aren't loving the idea of the sisters in pants either. All personal guesses. But clearly, it is not being met with universal happiness by all Jehovah's Witnesses. When it comes to insulting the intelligence of millions of people, few, three, few things, I should say, trump telling them how to care for their own body, their own hygiene, their own clothing. But that never stopped the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses before, as I just shared with you. They got down into our underwear. That's kind of uncomfortable to say. <laughs> what isn't immediately evident to anyone that believes these nine guys speak for God is why Jesus as you watch this update, is apparently no longer an effective communicator or teacher. And I have to tell you right here, I fully expect an upcoming Watchtower study series on how to put your pants on one leg at a time, what an acceptable belt looks like, how Satan himself invented underwear, boxers are pagan, and how it's wiser to have a beard because shaving involves shaving cream and, and we all know what shaving cream means that's got to that, that's going to lead to sex or something <laughs> that's going to be sexual i fully expect this people are going to push the boundaries people inside of jehovah's witnesses and our intelligence never gets to play a role they're going to tell us how to do it and i guess i'm just absolutely aghast with each of these videos that rolls out that these guys can so easily get on camera in condescending fashion and tell us how to deal with our own bodies. It's just absolutely incredible. And it goes to the depth of cognitive dissonance within this organization with the great people who are trapped in it and drowning in it. No one could see this as respectful banter. This is condescending, insulting of your intelligence. It's staggering. And with that, <laughs> that's all I got. Let's put governing body update number three and its endless list of insults to bed. Make sure you're in bed alone and you don't have a pillow. When I say bed, uh, make sure you never go near one unless you're married. <laughs> On and on. It, the absurdity just never ends. And now, I want to take a few minutes to uh, address the May 2024 JW broadcast, one that is filled with equally insulting material hosted by game show host. Uh, check that. 
a governing body helper, Ronald Curzon, who himself serves on the teaching committee. Oh boy. Yes, you heard that right. He is one of the guys teaching this stuff where he relates to Jehovah's Witnesses in this broadcast that they are all sheep. And well, as someone who is in the flock, I was for the greater portion of my life. This is one uncomfortable thing to say, but I agree. I agree. Sheep. That's the main point in the May 2024 JW broadcast. Ronald, a guy we are told is on par with someone like Samson or King David, and we're told will likely be a paradise elder. He's going to be, we're going to need elders in paradise. He'll probably be one of those guys. He starts the broadcast with the famous shepherd photo used on the draw close to Jehovah book. Most of us probably remember this. The shepherd cradling a lamb with a big smile on his face. The shepherd, not the lamb, that is. <laughs> he asked those of us watching if we see ourselves in the illustration. And I got to tell you, since the sisters don't have beards or are allowed to be shepherds or shepherd anything but their own kids, we can only assume that we're all supposed to see ourselves, I guess, as the little lamb, right? Goes without saying. And I have to tell you, the insults to our intelligence begin there. First, let's just get it out of the way from the beginning. I have an entire episode on sheep, if you're interested in that. It's some months ago. But look, strictly my opinion. But with a massive animal kingdom featuring all sorts of variety, sizes, shapes, and abilities, all brought to us by a guy who abstained from sex for 500 years and miraculously knew where to find giraffes. You remember that guy Noah. I snuck him in again. You, Ronald Curzon, in the governing body, you want to compare me to a sheep? I mean, come on. Even they know that there are more intelligent animal choices. But no, we are sheep, leveraging illustrations throughout the Bible, who was written by God, but you might consider it might have been written by, I don't know, a farming, agricultural, sheep herder type group of people. Never mind. The Awake of 2004, November 8th, pages 28 through 29, under Watching the World. That was such a cool section. It says this, quote, in recent research, birds have emerged as rivals to chimpanzees and dolphins for the title of the most intelligent non-human animals. Wow! Intelligence in animals. Back to the quote, reports the Sunday Times of London. A Cambridge University team put a hole in the side of a transparent tube, mounted the tube horizontally with the hole facing downward into another tube, and placed food inside it next to the hole. Primates tried to push the food out, losing it down the hole. But woodpecker finches used a stick to draw the food out without losing it. End quote. Right from their literature, 2004. So let me get this straight. Ronald Curzon, May 2024, GW Broadcasting, he is likening me and all of you, the rest of us, to a sheep. And it's clear there's more intelligent animals. Don't insult us, Ron. You know, like a chimp, a dolphin, or maybe a woodpecker that knows how to use a stick. Yeah, we're all sheep. <laughs> Back to the sheep thing. Back to the sheep thing. And I'm resisting going down a rabbit hole on this whole sheep thing. But that isn't the important point in this broadcast. Ron wants us to know that this is a beautiful description of Jehovah, as he says, from Isaiah 40, verse 11. That Jehovah is tender and that he loves his sheep. To his credit, he says people are undergoing many terrible challenges in the world. He goes on to list a few on the video. And we might not see ourselves 
as a precious little sheep or lamb. Never once does he admit many of those challenges for Jehovah's Witnesses are actually created by him and his nine bosses in upstate New York, including things like taking their families away from them, allowing pedophiles in their congregations, or the way they push Jehovah's Witnesses to constantly be doing more for them. He doesn't mention those as challenges. He just says you're having them, and you're like a lamb. The message meant to make an impression on our intelligence via this broadcast is that he sees your pain and he is ready to rescue you and lift you up with his strong arms like that lamb in the picture, directly quoting Brother Curzon. Unless you're one of those kids who is a victim of horrific child abuse inside Jehovah's Witnesses, and you just couldn't round up a second witness to the crime, unless you're one of those people, Jehovah sees your pain, and he wants to lift you up. Apparently, Jehovah gets too busy for, for some challenges. In his effort to appeal to our intelligence, Ron poses three questions he wants us all to consider during his talk that he undoubtedly prayed on, because we know how they feel about that, in May of 2024. Here's the three points. He asks us to consider, what does Jehovah do? How does he do it? And I got to tell you, my absolute favorite of the three, what do you need to do? And I couldn't help but think, wait, Ron, I thought I was that lamb being cradled in the shepherd's arms in the illustration. I have to do something while I'm in the pit of despair? <laughs> Apparently we do. Are you surprised? Are you surprised? I'm only going to highlight and comment on a few statements he makes in this talk. It's your standard Jehovah's Witness talk with silly questions and insulting assurances about how important Jehovah's Witnesses are to Jehovah, but even more importantly to the governing body. Time doesn't allow me to go into all of it, and I just can't with these guys. Sometimes I just can't. But here are some of the highlights and I guess you'd call them my instant rebuttals. At one point in the video, Ron asks, quote, How does Jehovah lead us? By means of his word. It helps us make righteous decisions. He never expects, uh, expects us to do more than we are able. End quote. As he uttered that comment, with as much respect as I can muster, I'll keep this brief. If Jehovah sees us as a sheep in his arms, and he is leading me when I read the Bible, well then, I must say it here and now, Ron, I'm deeply concerned. First, the Bible itself, look folks, it isn't all that kind to sheep. It isn't very kind to sheep. Sheep... Uh, do I dare say it? Does anyone but me remember what a sheep's eventuality is in the Bible? How about an example? Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 4 of the New World Translation tells us this, quote, Now the king and all the people offered sacrifices before Jehovah. King Solomon offered the sacrifice of 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep. Thus, the king and all the people inaugurated the house of the true God. End quote. <laughs> wow. Solomon, King Solomon, offered up a couple of circuits worth of Jehovah's Witnesses at his temple back in the day. <laughs> a sheep's story in the Bible never it never ends well folks it doesn't end well i mean even from the very first book of the bible we learn sheep especially good clean sheep the ones you would think stood out from the rest of the flock they end up barbecued in genesis chapter 22 and verse 8 right at the beginning of the bible we get this, quote, Then Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. He replied, My son. So he continued, 
here are the fire and the wood, but, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? To this, Abraham said, God himself will provide the sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And both of them walked on together, end quote. <laughs> You see, this illustration used by Ron, the governing body, and Jehovah's Witnesses on sheep, it has some problems. Jehovah has always loved sheep, especially how they smell on the Barbie. <laughs> especially when you burn them alive. In the governing body's own words on this thing, sheep, and this illustration that they roll out that I personally think is an insult to our intelligence, they tell us in the Insight from the Scriptures, Volume 2, which apparently they didn't want a picture in this illustration on the Draw Close to Jehovah book or the one draw that Ron is pointing at in this video, they forget this stuff. What they said, quote, Sheep provided the Hebrews and other peoples with numerous products. From the horns of the ram, containers, and sounding horns were made. Wait a minute, did they... Okay. Sheepskins sometimes served as clothing. Oh, wait a minute. Uh-oh. And ramskins that had been dyed red were used in the construction of the tabernacle. Sheep's wool furnished the fiber for what was probably the most common material for clothing. Sheep served as an important item of trade. Tra and they were even used to pay tribute. Both the milk... Uh, what? And the meat of sheep... <laughs> were items of diet wait a wait a minute mutton and lamb were enjoyed regularly by kings governors and others end quote wait a minute ron you're pointing at a picture of this shepherd with a sheep i'm pretty intelligent ron and you're we want to picture ourselves as the lamb this is how Jehovah views us so maybe you, Ron, and the governing body need to move away from this whole illustration once and for all, or uh, considering how Jehovah's Witnesses are treated, uh, do they? <laughs> I mean, the irony is not lost on any of us. Nevertheless, that same book, he is said, I should say, to be Jehovah's main tool for directing sheep, scratch that, Jehovah's Witnesses in 2024. And I, as of yet, haven't found a really great story about sheep in the entire book known as the Bible. They're defenseless, they settle for scraps, and as we've seen from the Bible itself and the governing body in the Insight book, sheep are nothing more than a resource. Wait a minute, it is all starting to make sense. So I'm a little put off by Ron's illustration that I'm a sheep being cuddled by Jehovah only to have me barbecued when he wants me to praise him. Uh, thank you, Jehovah. I, again, am I the only one? <laughs> Aside from his claim that Jehovah talks to his sheep with a book, he then goes on to insult the intelligence of even the best-intentioned Jehovah's Witness. He says Jehovah can be seen in how the congregation elders care for us. Where he says, quote, where they care for us spiritually, emotionally, and physically so that we will lack nothing, end quote. Congregation elders. Okay, Ron, okay. Look, I want to go off the rails right here, but then I remind myself, this is the same organization that pitches overlapping generations and expects us to buy that too. Not insulting at all, but, but, but the elders, the elders, he provides zero examples of how they care for us in these ways. He just makes the statement and moves on to his next comment. It's so subtle, and it, yet it's not. It's right there, and I don't even have enough time. Time to relate what I've experienced as an elder. 11 years serving in that role. Or the endless experience I've had with elders over my time as a JW. The people they tend to ignore. You know the folks. The single parents. The elderly. 
those that are chronically ill, especially those battling mental issues. For a Jehovah's Witness listening, how many shepherding calls have you had during your entire time as a Jehovah's Witness? Do tell. Remember, you are the entire reason the shepherds and elders exist in the congregation. So how many times have they called you, especially when things were rough? But Ron assures us in the May 2024 JW broadcast, he assures all intelligent Jehovah's Witnesses listening that the elders, quote, care for us all spiritually, emotionally, and physically. How exactly do they do this? I present to you one example of how elders and the nine guys they obey in upstate New York take care of Jehovah's Witnesses, those little sheep in that painting, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Are you ready? From the Watchtower of 1983, March 15th, pages 27 through 31, the set of articles entitled Honor Godly Marriage says this, quote, In some cases, there may be verbal and physical abuse, threats, and beatings. But does that mean that the Christian marriage mate should leave the unbeliever? The Apostle Paul counsels, a wife should not depart from her husband, but if she should actually depart, let her remain unmarried or else make up again with her husband, and a husband should not leave his wife. As Paul points out, preserving the marriage will be to the spiritual benefit of any children. In a practical way also, it may be to the material benefit of the believing parent and children. End quote. What do you say to this? Because Ron, I know the illustration you put on the screen with the shepherd and the lamb. I've seen it a thousand times. I myself used it in my talks, and I actually used it in a fight I had with a circuit overseer. And I got to tell you, Brother Curzon, I don't see this in that illustration. A woman, almost beaten to death, being sent back to the man who was handing out the beating and being told it was a good idea to do so for her and her children. There you are on video in JW Broadcast of May telling us that the elders take care of us spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Even as I accessed your Holy Spirit search bar and found that counsel in mere seconds. And it's one of a million examples of what Brother Ron Curzon and his bosses is talking to us about during the 2024 May JW broadcast. Ron is himself a shepherd. He is apparently really good at pointing to pretty paintings. But he would rather be in a group of so-called shepherds that easily pay a $4,000 a day fine because he is too good at protecting He's, he's so good at protecting Jehovah's Witnesses physically that he would rather pay that fine and run up a $2 million bill with the government than turn over the names of people harming children in his congregations, harming them spiritually, emotionally, and physically. But that sure is a pretty painting, Ron. That's Jehovah, huh? And I'm the Lamb? I'm going to stop there. He goes on in the talk to talk about a shepherd's staff, the Draw Close to Jehovah book again, and tons of other 
mind-numbingly insulting stuff that never answers any basic questions like the ones I posed here. He even shows us a painting of a shepherd that he says has adorned the conference room of the governing body since the 1970s, claiming it's a visual reminder of the importance of their work as shepherds. And undoubtedly, that conference room and the painting is just a few floors away from a secret database of criminals that live in their congregations, harming kids. But we did get to see governing body member Garrett Loesch in the J-Dub broadcast dissecting the painting, including the clouds and the weather. <laughs> he says that the governing body looks at the painting during their meetings and discusses how to apply it all. Ron then tells us we should obey them because of the paintings and stuff. A painting that doesn't feature pants, beards, or, uh, it's odd. The level of delusion among the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses is something to behold. It is becoming worse, it is grave in nature, and it's an insult to our intelligence. In a matter of just a couple of weeks, the religion of Jehovah's Witnesses has completely changed. But the insult to our intelligence is not. It's the same game plan it's always been. Rolled out as new direction to a new generation of Jehovah's Witnesses. It's odd to see Jesus have to explain himself as often as he does. It's almost as if he doesn't know his flock. It's odd. I guess he didn't know that pants thing was going to be a problem. Or that the same elders who protect us spiritually and physically are the ones telling us to go back to an abusive spouse. The governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses claims and wants you to believe that everything they teach you is for your benefit and oh, how they love you. But if you listen closely, if you take the time to think about the claims that they made in both of these videos, you can see it isn't true. Pretty paintings don't cover it over. Pants don't cover it over. Losing a necktie doesn't cover it over. From the Watchtower of 1960, February 15th, pages 105 through 110, under the article, Safeguard Your Thinking Ability, the governing body tells us this, quote, the existence of intelligent, reasoning personalities with minds is one of the proofs that man was created by a higher intelligence, a personal God, because mere unreasoning force or impersonal unintelligence could never bring forth the reasoning, intelligent, individual thinking personalities existing in humankind. End quote. It's a good quote. I, I dare say it, I'm going to throw him a bone. It's wise words from the faithful slave. And it's their words. So if you're a Jehovah's Witness listening in, you get to decide if Jesus Christ and his father Jehovah are interested in your pants or your beards or if they've been cradling you like a little lamb and whether they now need to explain themselves better by means of Jeff Winder and his friend Ron Curzon. As you tap into your own intelligence, does anything you saw in these videos make sense to you? Full disclosure, as for me, I'm in the same camp as Samuel Goldwyn, the famous movie producer, who once said, quote, Give me a smart idiot over a stupid genius any day. End quote. Do you see what I did there? I want to thank you for being here this week. We just hit the highlights, or might I say lowlights. Wherever you may be, be well.